In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain's Report, we are going to be continuing our series in Samuel. And in 1 Samuel 10, 25 through 27, you may recall from our previous installments that what's going on here is Saul has basically just been anointed and crowned king. They've made it public. All of Israel now knows this. And this particular passage of scripture is interesting because it deals with the reaction to it. Because if you remember the lead up to this and, and the passages of scripture we're already, we've already gone through, for the longest time, Israel didn't have a king. First, they had Moses, and when they went into the promised land under Joshua, they established a system of judges. So you had people that made judgments on things where you had a dispute with your neighbors, but as far as having an actual ruler or a king or any kind of real government structure, Israel didn't really do that. Their governing structure was the law and the priest and the judges and the commandments that Moses gave them. They didn't really have all that formal a governing structure. And so... Throughout all of that time, Israel keeps begging God, hey, give us a king, make us like every other nation. And God, for a very long time, hundreds of years even goes, no, I'm not going to do that. No, it's a bad idea. Trust me, you don't need a human on earth being your king. It's going to end badly. And finally, they've pestered him long enough that God's like, fine, that's what you want. That's what I'm going to give you. Here's your king. And that, of course, takes, uh, takes place in the form of King Saul, and this is the reaction to that. You'll see in 1 Samuel 10, verses 25 through 27. Then Samuel told the people that the ordinances of the kingdom, and wrote them in a book and placed them before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his house. Saul also went to his house in Gibeah, and the valiant men whose hearts God had touched went with him. But certain worthless men said, how can this one deliver us? And they despised him and did not bring him any presents, but he kept silent. Well, that's really interesting. In this particular passage, I, I do find my initial gut reaction is to some degree somewhat similar to what we were just talking about in the whole thing where the media was asking Trump to do one thing, he did that exact thing, and then they were upset at him for doing so. It's kind of the same thing here. It's a lesson in human nature, which hasn't changed that much in the past 3,000, 4,000 years. You can't please people. Even when you do what people ask, even when people beg for something and harp on it and they needlessly talk about it, and then you give it to them, there's still going to be people that are upset with you for even doing that. I mean, we should know this from earlier in the Old Testament. Remember how Israel had been crying out for nearly 400 years of bondage to have, to have themselves brought out of Egypt and be delivered? And when God finally did that and brought them out of Egypt, they fussed, they complained, they moaned, they naysayed, like, you can't please those people. There's always going to be people that are malcontents in the crowd. But before we even get to them, I do find it really interesting, the last part of verse 26 there, where when Saul went to his house, there were men whose hearts God had touched. So I don't think that this was, and we actually discussed this just a couple days ago, God having some kind of supernatural control over humans and basically making them automatons that previously were not going to obey him and then all of a sudden wanted to obey him because God did something to them. It's more like these were the people that already had an open mind and an open heart, and God just assisted with that process. So they already had an open mind and open heart, and then God kind of helped them along the right path because they had a willingness to find that path, so he helps them walk it. He doesn't do it for them. He doesn't make them want to walk the path. It's just when he sees a desire there, he works on it. He develops it, and he helps them in the process of doing so. That seems to be what's going on here. But it does sort of give us an idea of and, and help remind us 
that God is going to help us in that process too. When he puts something forward that he wants us to do, when there is somebody that he wants us to, to follow, that God aids in that process, as long as we have the right frame of mind and heart. But it does go back to this idea that that doesn't happen to everybody. Not everybody's going to be willing to follow, and God could have theoretically just overridden these naysayers' free will and make them want to follow Saul, but he didn't do that. This passage of Scripture is showing a very clear contrast. The people whom God is with and whom he is not. Not because of some kind of pre-existing condition to where God decided ahead of time that he's going to predestine certain people to obey him and predestine certain people not to. He gave everybody the opportunity to do so. Some people took him up on that offer and some people chose not to. But you just can't please everybody even when you capitulate to the very thing that, you were, that they were asking you to do. And I think it's really funny, it's a little bit of commentary that the writer of Samuel is giving here, where he says that the, the Bible describes them as the worthless men. The worthless men who brought him no presents, and uh, um, they, they basically just dissed him in doing this. So the, whether it was the, the head of a tribe, or an elder, or somebody that was a bigwig within their own individual part of Israel, those were the people that did not pay him homage and, and did not acknowledge him as king, basically. So I find that really interesting that these are the people that doubted Saul. But it wasn't really so much that they were doubting Saul, was it? They were saying, how can this one person deliver us? Hasn't one person delivered Israel in the past? Wasn't it Moses that delivered people in the time of Egypt and, and the captivity? Wasn't it uh, looking back, hasn't it been individuals that God called upon, whether you're talking about the different judges, with Deborah, with Samson, uh, with Gideon? And yet they're looking at this guy and going, how can one man make a difference in this fight? Here's what's actually going on here. These people had already basically made up their mind that they didn't want to follow Saul, that this thing wasn't going to work out. And ultimately, they weren't just doubting Saul, they were doubting God. If God says, hey, I'm going to deliver you from the Philistines, and this is the guy I'm going to use to do it, and you go, one man can't do that, you're not really doubting the person, you're doubting God. Because do you think Moses could have delivered Egypt from Pharaoh by himself? Heck no. And Moses knows that. Moses wrote about that frequently. But with God, it's possible. That's the same way it is today. When you're doubting whether or not a person is capable, for example, of salvation and becoming a Christian, well, on their own, yeah, of course they can't. But doubting that is not doubting them, it's doubting God, doubting His power to save, doubting His grace, doubting His goodness, doubting His mercy. And that's a trap that we don't need to find ourselves falling into. Just like these men, they should have trusted that if God said He's going to deliver Israel by Saul, then he's absolutely going to do it. They were really doubting God and his ability to do what he said he was going to do. And I think that it's funny, and it also provides a little commentary here, that it calls them the worthless men, not just because they were naysayers and, and it's kind of throwing shade on them. More importantly, it's because what had they done to deliver Israel? They're basically sitting back in their chairs. Oh, yeah, like one guy is going to actually do anything to deliver Israel. The obvious rebuttal to that is, well, then maybe you should help him. Why aren't you doing something to deliver Israel? You've been here this whole time. You've been an influential person in your tribe or in Israel. Why haven't you delivered Israel? It's real easy to be a critic when you don't really have to own up to it. It's really easy to be a critic and not actually do anything to solve it yourself. It becomes much harder to become a critic when you've tried to do the very thing you're being critical of other people on because you realize how difficult it actually is. And I actually really love Saul's reaction. Again, early Saul is actually a really interesting person and, and somebody that really does have a heart for God and, and does a lot of the right things. Obviously, later he devolves into a villain, but early Saul is somebody to be admired. And in this particular episode, Saul's reaction is he kept silent. He wasn't ignorant of them. He knew they were there. He knew what they were saying. He had heard. 
And as the new king, he had the power to not only deride them for that, he could have picked them up and called them insurrectionists and killed them theoretically if he had wanted to. But he didn't. He just let them talk. It's very reminiscent of something that Thomas Jefferson used to do. You see, Thomas Jefferson had a policy that is very unlike politicians of today, very uh, unlike Trump, for example, where if people delivered any kind of personal attack against him, he wouldn't talk about it. Now, if they wanted to debate him on ideas, liberty, how government should work, that kind of thing, oh, you better believe he'd give you the fight of your life. But if you wanted to attack him personally, he just wouldn't say anything about it. There were people during his administration that even were accusing him of sleeping with one of his slaves, a rumor that actually wound up cropping up again in the 1990s amid the Clinton scandal. But, you know, not to get in uh, off into the weeds on that, even something as salacious and vitriolic as that, Thomas Jefferson never addressed it. Because he said, and he was asked about this, he said, eventually, history will find that stuff out. Eventually, people are going to find out the truth. And it doesn't make any sense to get caught up in a bunch of those useless, frivolous arguments to defend your own character. I'd call that humility. I'd call that meekness. That's a pretty good policy for anybody, actually. I mean, when you talk about somebody that's lobbying a personal insult to you, and that person has the, the wherewithal and fortitude and confidence in themselves, and in Jefferson and Saul's case, confidence in God, that they can just sit back and go, ah, whatever. They say what they want. You see... That's somebody that does, unlike the worthless men, have faith that God is going to do what he says he is going to do. Because Saul knew at this point that God was with him. And if God's with you, do you really need anybody else's support? Do you really need anybody else to approve of what you're doing if you know you're on God's side? The answer is no. Saul knew that. Jefferson knew that. And I hope that we know that that as long as God is on our side, we don't really need everybody's approval. And the fact that there are going to be some naysayers that don't like us or are going to chastise us about it, that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Just like Thomas Jefferson and just like Saul, you know, that'll go by the wayside. The more important thing is to make sure that you're on God's side, not that everybody else is on yours. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, Woke Brigade.